This was exciting for me for a long time. This was, I did my PhD thesis on this topic. And this is a topic that improves memory latency tolerance. This is the first lecture on memory latency tolerance. And we've seen some techniques to tolerate memory latency before, but we're going to cover some other techniques uh, in the upcoming lectures. Uh, well, I guess that's what we'll do. Start memory latency tolerance. We've covered memory. You've seen the latencies involved in accessing memory. And a lot of computer architecture today, uh, or processor design today, is about how to tolerate these latencies efficiently. And rendered execution is one method of tolerating those latencies efficiently. Uh, Prefetching will be another method, which we briefly touched on, but we'll go into a lot more detail in the next few lectures. I guess before I move on, uh, not all of you are here. I assume some of you are still working on the lab. Coming to lectures is still important. <laughs> uh, how, how, are you guys all done with the lab, since you're all here? Extra credit. Oh, extra credit. That's good. Well, I look forward to your extra credit assignment, too. Uh, and you can do, for your extra credit, you can do much better than the, uh, so for example, if you want to improve the branch predictor, you can actually tell us that our branch predictor sucks and <laughs> you, can you can turn in a better branch predictor, but as, tell, tell us under what conditions your branch predictor works better. So we'll take that as ex extra credit too. I'm happy to ex uh, enable you to explore your creativity uh, in, in the labs, even though we, don't, we may not specify it. Okay. Uh, the, uh, the second announcement is lab, well, I guess there are three announcements. That was one. The second is lab six. Originally, we said it's due April 18th, right? So we're, go push we're going to push that two days out. So it's going to be April 20th, which is Sunday, which is Sunday, just like we pushed lab five out. So hopefully that will give you enough days. And third is we don't have class this Friday since it's the spring carnival. It's an early spring carnival, isn't it? Yeah. yeah. Isn't it normally April 20th or April 19th, the week after? But anyway, we don't have class this Friday. But uh, please check off your lab five uh, on the Thursday lab or the Tuesday lab. Wait. Yes. This week, yes. Th oh, Thursday there's no class either? Yeah. Thursday is spring carnival too? OK. Well, uh, if you cannot check off your lab on Tuesday, make sure you check it off next week. <laughs> How about that? I didn't know that there was no class Thursday. I guess I, normally I don't teach Thursday, so I don't care if there's class on Thursday or not. But this time, uh, it did matter. OK. Uh, any questions, announcements? Should we jump, jump into latency, memory latency tolerance? All right. Well, I guess I'll give you more required readings, too. Uh, this is a paper I had written. This is the first paper I had written, actually, uh, in my career. I'll, I'll, I'll make you read that. <laughs> it's a fun paper. It's still fun to me. Uh, the writing could be improved, but I think uh, that's how it is. That's what you realize after a few years, even. Uh, that's, uh, that discusses run rate execution. Uh, this is the second paper, uh, which we'll talk about prefetching, and re which we will cover in the next few lectures. So these two papers should give you a good idea of what we're going to talk about next. There are a bunch of optional papers, which, uh, some of which we will talk about in today's lecture. Uh, you don't need to read them, but if you want to delve deeper into run rate execution and latency tolerance mechanisms and some prediction mechanisms which we will talk about, uh, this should be good reading. OK, we're going to talk about tolerating the long memory latencies. And let me make sure that this is actually happening. And it is happening. Uh, and this is a form of latency tolerance, right? Memory latency is no different from any other latency, except it's long. <laughs> and latency tolerance, we've already seen one method, actually, it's multiple methods of tolerating latencies. But out of order execution was one method for tolerating latency, right? And you tolerate latency of multi-cycle operations by executing independent instructions concurrently. While you're waiting for the result of this operation, some other instruction that's independent of it can execute. That's how you latency, to tolerate latencies. You're overlapping multiple instructions, execution latencies. And memory latency is one of them. Uh, and you all, you, you all know how it, the out-of-order execution does. It does so by buffering instructions at the reservation station and reorder buffer. Uh, and we've, we know the concept of the instruction window, right? The instruction window uh, encompasses hardware resources that are needed to buffer all decoded but not yet retired or committed instructions. That's the reorder buffer. And everything else is associated with the instructions that are decoded but not yet retired. Reorder buffer entries, register file entries, store buffer entries, load buffer entries, anything that you can think of reservation stations, all these instructions consume these resources. Some of them may not be load, 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 load store queue entries, for example, but some of them do. Uh, 
So you need all of that hardware infrastructure to tolerate the latency. The problem is instructions that have long latencies. If an instruction takes a long time to execute, you need a large instruction window so that the machine doesn't stall. Right? And uh, we've looked at this example before. If, you act, if an act, instruction actually takes 500 cycles to service, and in today's systems, instructions take very long if they need to access memory. For example, in, in, a, in an old Xbox, the latencies were over 600 cycles, 600 processor cycles, to access main memory. If this is the case, you need a large instruction window. And if you're actually super scalar, let's say you're fetching four instructions per cycle, and your one instruction takes fi 500 cycles, then you need a you need a 2,000 entry window to be able to not stall at all. Right? Basically, we've discussed this before, so I'm going to give the answer. How many cycles of latency can out of order execution tolerate? Well, whatever the instruction window allows it to tolerate. Right? Uh, and if you do not have an instruction window that's large enough, you stall. Let's take a look at that stall. When, it, when a long latency instruction is not complete, it blocks retirements. It cannot retire. And nothing that comes after it can retire, because remember, the model is precise exceptions. We need to maintain precise exceptions. You can only retire an instruction only after it's complete. And you cannot retire any other instruction that comes after that. As a result, incoming instructions fill the instruction window. Reorder buffer, reservation stations, load store queue, entry, queue entries, register file entries, they all get filled with these incoming instructions. And once the window is full, browser now cannot make progress at all. It cannot place new instructions into the window. This, this is called a full window stall. Basically, the window becomes full, and the processor stalls. There may be other causes of stalls. For example, you may, you may have lots of uh, reorder buffer entries, but uh, you fetch too many loads. You, you put too many loads into the machine. And the load buffer size is 24 entries. Reorder buffer size is 128 entries. And you've already fetched 24 loads, which means that you cannot fetch the next load because that would be the 25th load. right? You do not have enough load buffer entries. So there may be other stalls. But I'm generalizing everything with a full window stall. Assume that uh, uh, you have 128 entries for every possible instructions, let's say. Uh, then you're limited by the number of entries you can support in the reorder buffer for, uh, so that you can continue decoding. We're not going to go get into other kinds of stalls. So modern machines try to optimize the size of these buffers instead of having a monolithic size for everything. Because remember, the store buffer is a very difficult buffer to design. If you actually have uh, 128 stores, and if you actually need to search 128 stores in that buffer uh, every cycle, that's a very expensive search in terms of both cycle time, hardware complexity, and power consumption. So what designers today do, they try to size those buffers such that they can get a good critical path, which means that usually the size of that buffer is smaller than the, number of, the total number of instructions that you can have that is decoded but not yet retired in the machine. Which means that if you have too many stores in the machine uh, th that you're fetching in the program, you may stall before the reorder buffer is full because you're limited by your store buffer size. Anyway, let's take a look at full window stalls in this case. A full window stall prevents the processor from making progress in the execution of the program. Let me give you an example. Uh, assume that you have an eight entry instruction window and assume that all of the buffers are sized accordingly. Uh, let's say you get this load instruction. It gets an L2 miss. It takes hundreds of cycles. And then you have a branch instruction that comes after that. And you predict that branch, something happens. And then you keep fetching these instructions that are independent of the load and the branch. Well, they're dependent on the branch in a control flow sense, but not data dependent on any of these instructions. That's why they're green over here. You keep fetching these instructions. And eventually, uh, you execute these instructions. But these cannot be retired, right? because this load is still going on. It's taking hundreds of cycles. Now, if you the program counter is at this instruction, but you cannot execute this instruction because you cannot place it into the instruction window, right? because your reorder buffer is full. You do not have enough resources in the machine to execute it. The processor stalls until the cell 2 miss is serviced. And long latency cache miss are actually responsible for most full window stalls, uh, as I will show you later. But wouldn't it be nice if you actually fetch this instruction and execute it? Wouldn't it be extra nice if this instruction were actually an L2 cache miss? Right? If this instruction is an L2 cache miss, you're only going to service that L2 cache miss after you service this L2 cache miss, because you do not have enough resource in the window. Right? Whereas if you had a ninth entry in, in your instruction window, you would, have able to, you, you, you would have been able to fetch this instruction, 
generate this L2 cache miss, and overlap the latency of this L2 cache miss with this L2 cache miss. Make sense? So one entry, one re reorder buffer entry, one instruction window entry would have overlapped the latency of these long latency instructions. Because you do not have them, have the extra entry, now these latencies need to be serialized because you cannot place this instruction into the window before this instruction gets out of the window. So that's what we're going to try to achieve with run-ahead execution. Somehow have this small instruction window, but recirculate the entries such that these instructions that cause long latency cache misses can get in and overlap their latencies and get out. And we'll see how to do that. But the goal is to not enlarge the size of the instruction window. We'll see that. Right. But let's take a look at I'm get, getting ahead on myself. Let's take a look at uh, some data that shows cache misses are actually responsible for most full window stalls. This is data that I had collected a long time ago, 2002 now, uh, on a Pentium 4-like processor simulator uh, with this kind of cache, this kind of DRAM latency, aggressive prefetching. And this is data average across uh, approximately 140 memory intensive uh, benchmarks. These were uh, from a suite that were drawn uh, uh, out of all traces that Intel used at the time to actually design and evaluate their processors. And Pentium 4 was one of them. Nehalem was the next one after that. But basically, this shows what fraction of the time is actually spent stalling in this kind of processor, Pentium 4-like processor. Uh, 100 is all of the time to execute uh, the programs. The processor spends only about 32% of its time not stalling. It's doing something, computing. 68% of its time is spent stalling. Make sense? Not good, right? <laughs> we do not want to have this, but that's, that's the effect of memory latency on the program execution. And most of this non-stall time, full window stall time, uh, most of the full window stall time is spent waiting for L2 cache misses. How many, uh, basically, the, the way to collect this data is to look at all of the cycles that you take to execute the program and look at how many times you have an L2 cache miss uh, at the head of the reorder buffer that you cannot retire, that you cannot commit. So this is not good. Ideally, we would like to minimize this as much as possible. This was actually, uh, just to fetch ahead a little bit, there was a question on last year's final that is related to this. I'd l I'll encourage you to go back and look at that. And we could put, it at, put that on the homework, next homework. Okay. So how do we actually tolerate these stalls due to uh, memory? How do we actually reduce this uh, fraction of time that we're actually stalling for memory? There are two major approaches. Well, we could reduce or eliminate these stalls uh, somehow by prefetching, for example. Or we could tolerate the effect of a stall when it happens. And these some, uh, the, the line between these are some, sometimes blurry. Uh, but for example, out of order execution tolerates the effect of a stall. It doesn't prevent the stalls, right? Well, uh, in a sense, when you stall for a long latency cache miss over here, if you have enough window entries, you will tolerate the effect of the stall by overlapping other long latency cache misses with it. Right? That's a latency tolerance technique. There are four fundamental techniques to achieve these. Uh, we've seen actually one, two of them. Uh, well, three of them, I guess. We've seen caching. Caching eliminates the stalls. Uh, Multi-threading. Multi-threading tolerates the stalls. But you need multiple threads to do this. Uh, out of order execution tolerates the stall just, with, just as we've discussed. Prefetching we briefly mentioned, but we haven't looked at. So we're going to cover that next. And many techniques have been developed to make these uh, fundamental techniques more effective in tolerating memory latency. So we're, we're going to take a look at run ahead execution, which is a technique to make out of order ex execution even more effective. Actually, which is a technique by itself because it can be applied to in order execution as well, as we will see. Let's take a look at these in a little bit more detail, uh, pros and cons. I guess you should be pretty comfortable with the pros and cons of one, two, three over here. Maybe not prefetching yet. But these are actually techniques that were initially developed in the 1960s, all of these techniques. Uh, caching, you've seen the uh, Wilkes paper that I mentioned. This is widely used. Uh, it's a simple technique. It's very effective, as we've seen, because locality exists in many, many programs today. But it's inefficient and passive. Why, why is it passive? Because you need to uh, remember the compulsory misses. Caching cannot eliminate compulsory misses, right? You need to have this good locality behavior. And if your working set size is huge, again, caching may not be very effective. And not all applications or phases exhibit temporal or spa spatial locality. That's one downside of caching. You cannot eliminate misses if you do not have temporal or spatial locality. So this is a good technique that's been widely employed in processors, but it doesn't always work. 
In fact, you need to do more, basically. It doesn't get rid of all of the cache misses. Well, you, you, you will still have cache misses after this, basically. The prefetching, this was initially developed in IBM 360.91, which actually had uh, out of order execution as well. Uh, but this works well for regular memory access patterns, as we will see in the next lecture. Basically, how do you predict the next access pattern before uh, you actually, the processor actually accesses it? It's usually much easier to do that if the access pattern is regular, if the processor is accessing address a, a plus 2, a plus 4, a plus 6, a plus 8, dot, dot, dot. It's easy to figure that out. If the processor is accessing addresses randomly, then it's very difficult to do this. Uh, so irregular access patterns is difficult and usually inaccurate and hardware intensive. And we'll take a look at that too. Multi-threading, we've seen this, right? And uh, this works well if there are multiple threads. If you have only a single thread, in, fine -grade, in a fine-grained multi-thread processor, you're actually getting one nth of the th throughput, right, as we've discussed, where n is the number of threads that you uh, need to support. And people have actually developed techniques to improve single thread performance using multi-threading hardware. So let's say you have fine-grained multi-threading engine. Uh, uh, people have uh, developed techniques such that uh, to inject threads into the machine, speculative threads, helper threads, that can prefetch for the main thread, for example. We're not going to talk about that. And I encourage you to take 742 next semester if you're interested in that. But people try to take advantage of this multiple thread hardware to improve single threads performance instead of running totally independent threads. Can we actually construct a thread that can do work for this main thread that we really care about? And one idea is to construct a thread that prefetches for the main thread. Another idea is to construct a thread that actually predicts the branches in the main thread. It's pretty interesting, right? Another idea is to run uh, two versions of the same thread, but one is going a little bit ahead of the other one such that you can actually see, find these cache misses and find these branch predictors such that both threads can run faster. This is called slipstreaming fuel. And this happens actually in car races, Formula One or NASCAR races. Two cars get really close to each other. And they, uh, they drive very fast that way because one of them actually uh, blocks the wind off it, off the other one. As a result, both of them can increase their speeds. It's pretty interesting. <laughs> it's kind of similar here. It's, it's, the analogy is slipstreaming. OK, well, not, we're not going to talk about that. That's a, that's, we'll talk about that some, in 742. Out of order execution, uh, this was the Tomasov's algorithm that we've seen that was initially designed by that. Actually, initially, it wasn't Tomasov. It was a different form of uh, out of order execution. CDC 6600 had a different form of out of order execution algorithm. But uh, Tomasov's algorithm was more elegant. Uh, this tolerates irregular cache misses that cannot be prefetched, right? This is, it's difficult to uh, uh, basically, uh, it's, well, I guess the out of order execution's biggest benefit is tolerating this kind of cache misses. Uh, because if you, if you can prefetch it in a simple way, it's great to have a prefetcher to do it. But if you cannot prefetch it, then your out of order execution is a good way to tolerate it. The problem is it requires extensive hardware resources for tolerating long latencies. And we'll talk about this in a second. Uh, the goal of run ahead execution is to alleviate this problem. Well, as we'll see in the current lecture, that needs to be fixed. <laughs> Let me fix it. OK. PowerPoint is saving that weird file that it renamed. There you go. So we'll talk about run-ahead execution today. But keep in mind that run-ahead execution alleviates this problem, but it can also be applied to in-order execution, as we will see. So I've already shown you this. Basically, if you have a small window, you get a full window stall. And you may not want to get a full window stall because if you had one more entry in your instruction window, you would have actually generated the cache miss for this instruction uh, and overlapped the latency of this cache miss with the latency of this cache miss over here, assuming they go to different banks. Right? Again, uh, you can exploit memory level parallelism, assuming that these accesses can be serviced in parallel by the memory system. That's why having multiple banks is very important. Okay. Uh, and I've already shown you that L2 cache misses are actually responsible for most full window stalls. In this case, uh, for these workloads, the processor is stalling uh, about 54, uh, for about 55% of its execution time for L2 cache misses. There, there is a remaining portion over here. The processor is still stalled full window st uh, due to full window stalls. And the instruction at the head that cannot be retired is not an L2 cache miss. It's something else. Can anybody guess what could it, it could be? Like why these stalls exist? Floating points could be one of them, right? It could be a, another long latency operation. It could be a chain of long latency operations. Uh, that's why you may not be making fast progress. Uh, 
It could be a chain of L1 cache versus L2 cache hits, for example, because those could, those could take long also. As a result, you may be stalling the processor even though you don't have an L2 cache miss. Outstanding. So if you actually do this, basically, ideally, design a 2048 entry window processor, this is what you get in simulation. Isn't it nice? The execution time reduces from nor uh, a normalized 100 to about 66, I guess, 68 maybe. Right. So you get 34% performance benefit. And now the fraction of the time that's, that this processor spends waiting for L2 cache misses is much smaller. Make sense? So ideally, we would like to achieve something like this. Or our goal is to approximate the performance benefits of this 2048 entry window without actually having to build it. Because now you can imagine what's the uh, complexity of building a machine that, uh, that has 2048 entries in its reorder buffer, register file, load store queue, uh, rename map, register alias table. Well, register alias table scales with the architectural register file, uh, architectural register count, right? But uh, it's with scales with the entries in the window. Re but you still need reservation stations, 2048 entry, uh, entry reservation stations. Does this make sense? So it's difficult to build this machine. But we'll try to approximate the benefits of it. And I'll let you think about why this green actually grows. Any thoughts? So this green, with a 128 entry window, uh, the machine spends this time, this amount of time, not stalling. With the 2048 entry window, the machine spends this much amount of time not stalling. Yes? Because maybe some of them, because this one stalls so much, some of the green is actually computed while it's stalling. That's right. That's, that's one reason, exactly. Yes. That's actually one, one good reason. Because there is some uh, computation that's actually happening over here. The other reason is actually branch mispredictions, too. So branch predictor is not perfect here. So non-stall time includes wrong path execution time, too. You may be not stalling, but you may be doing useless work that's going to be thrown away. Right. Okay. But in the end, it doesn't matter. By enlarging the, making the window 8x the size of the window that you have today, you can improve performance by about 34% on average across approximately 150 workloads. That's, that's, a, that's a strong result. So how do we actually achieve this? The problem is, let me restate it, out-of-order execution requires large instruction windows to tolerate today's main memory latencies. As main memory latency increases, instruction window size should also increase to fully tolerate the memory latency. And there has been a trend for a long time in computer architecture. The processor speed increased significantly. The memory speed did not increase. As a result, uh, the memory latency increased in terms of the processor cycles, in terms of the number of processor cycles. Now, this has been tamed a little bit because processor speeds are not as increasing as fast, and memory speed is increasing. But still, uh, the, the number of cycles needed to access memory is on the order of hundreds today. And going forward, we'll have electron non-volatile memory technologies in the future. Maybe we'll have longer latency memories attached to the memory hierarchies of today. So the, pr the problem is that building a large instruction window is a challenging task. Uh, well, let me finish that thought. Not, we'll have non-volatile memory technologies attached to the memory hierarchies of today. And the non-volatile memory technologies that we have today are usually long latencies. Imagine flash memory being part of your main memory. That's not today, because flash latency is very long. Uh, it's too long to actually be useful for main memory. But we'll talk about phase change memory or spin transfer torque uh, MRAM, which have long latencies compared to DRAM. So if you have something like that, memory latency would increase a lot more going forward. Uh, the problem is building a large instruction window is a challenging task, especially if you would like to achieve all of these. Low power and energy consumption, uh, short cycle time, low design and verification complexity. And we've talked about the complexity of, for example, tag broadcast. right? Uh, and uh, th that tag matching logic scales linearly with the number of entries you have in the reorder buffer, and actually linearly with the issue width, actually more than linearly with either of those. So if you actually increase both, you'll get quadratic increase in the size of uh, this logic, and you get more than quadratic increase in the uh, power and energy consumption of this logic. And cycle time, similarly. You would like to be able to access the register file uh, the physical register file or the reservation stations in a single cycle, ideally. Right? And if you increase the size to 2048 or 4096, now those structures become really slow. 
And design and verification complexity is another one. It's already very difficult to design an out of order processor with all of that complexity. If you actually increase the size of the window, now you need to meet some cycle time, meet some power budget. At the same time, be able to design and verify that processor in a, in a, in a reasonable amount of time. And in fact, much of the processor design time today in, uh, for an out of order processor is spent for the design and verifica for, for verification and validation. It's approximately 30 to 40% of the time it takes to actually market a processor from the start to, to marketing. So this is, a, this is a big problem, actually. This is one of the biggest problems that led, to, that led people to design multi-core processors instead of trying to improve the performance of single-core processors. OK. So this is uh, the, the efficient scaling of instruction window size is actually one of the major research issues in out-of-order execution today. How do we actually? make this a lot more efficient. How do we achieve the benefits of a large window with a small window, or in a simpler way? And how do we efficiently tolerate memory latency with the machinery of out of order execution and a small instruction window? So that's uh, uh, one, one idea that we've seen is memory level parallelism. Right? The idea was find and service multiple cache misses in parallel so that the processor stalls only once for all misses. So this is just a reminder. Uh, and this enables latency tolerance because now you can overlap the latency of different misses. And we've seen several techniques to generate multiple misses, out of order execution, multi-threading, and prefetching. Now we'll see run ahead. The idea of run ahead is actually basically this. It's a technique to obtain the memory level parallelism benefits of a large instruction window without building that large instruction window. Uh, basically, the idea is this. You keep the size of the instruction window the same as your baseline. You don't try to improve it. Instead, when the oldest instruction is a long latency cache miss in your instruction window, you take a checkpoint of the architectural state and enter run ahead mode, a special mode of processing. The checkpoint of the architectural state is the program counter and the register file. Actually, if you remember a register alias table, you can take a checkpoint of the register alias table. And you never deallocate the, the, the checkpoint again until you exit this mode. In run ahead mode, this is speculative processing mode. Uh, the processor speculatively pre-executes the instructions. I say pre-execute because it's going to execute them again later. The purpose of this pre-execution is to generate prefetches. You already uh, actually checkpoint the architectural state. You're going to use the out-of-order execution machinery to execute these instructions just to generate prefetches. L2 misdependent instructions, these are the ones that are actually causing the stalls. You don't want them to cause stalls in this mode. Basically, the processor marks them with a special bit called the invalid bit, and drops them, basically. Because the data is not going to come back for hundreds of cycles. The processor doesn't wait for them. It basically inserts a bit into the register file, and inserts a bit, uh, it marks their result as invalid, and that invalid bit is propagated across instructions through the out of order execution machinery. Right? So all instructions that cause an L2MIS and that are dependent on an L2MIS know that they are dependent on an L2MIS. They are marked as invalid. And these instructions do not get executed. They, get, they, they simply get dropped from the machine. Well, I, I guess I don't need to write it down. I already said it. So, but all other instructions are actually executed. Right? And what you do is you actually, uh, let me actually show this over here. So let's say you figured out the oldest instructions in L2 cache miss with a load into R1. And you have all of these other instructions that are waiting for it. The processor basically marks R1 as invalid, so in the register alias table, and uh, as part of the value that is broadcast for this load, R1 is marked as invalid. You have invalid bits. And this instruction basically gets out of the machine. Now you created one space in the instruction window, because you actually checkpointed the architectural state at the beginning. Now, all of the instructions that are dependent on this load, let's say you have a branch over here that's dependent on R1, and you do something, this instruction receives that it's actually invalid, because this load broadcast its result and got out of the machine. And this branch figures out that it's actually invalid. Now, this branch broadcasts, well, if it needs to. In case of a branch, you don't need to broadcast, right? You just need to uh, figure out what to do with the branch. In this case, we do not know the result of the branch. It's invalid, so we basically keep going with the branch predictor. And this branch gets out of the machine, too. Now you've created two spaces in the instruction window. Make sense? So you keep executing other instructions. Instructions that are dependent on the cache misses are marked as invalid and dropped. But instructions that are 
not dependent, independent of the L2 cache miss, get executed. And if these are instructions that generate cache misses, they become invalid and they get dropped. And now you can move the instruction window. You can actually keep fetching new instructions because you're creating space in the instruction window by getting rid of instructions in the machine. The instructions that are valid get executed, and they get out of the machine. The instructions that are invalid do not get executed, but they get dropped, and they get out of the machine. Yes? What if the valid ones are dependent on the invalid ones? They become invalid, right? Because whenever an invalid instruction broadcasts its result, it broadcasts the invalid bit also. Okay. And that becomes invalid at that point. Okay. So you latch on the invalid ones. Exactly. Okay. And then you, you drop them. Basically, the retirement remains the same. I'll, I'll, I'll show you an example. But uh, so you keep feeding new instructions into the machine. That's basically the key idea, by getting rid of old instructions, not stalling the machine. Make sense? So that's the key idea. We'll, we'll take a look at uh, how it operates in a, in a slide, basically. And, when, and this mode ends when the original miss returns. The original miss is the oldest instruction that caused entry into this, this mode. And at the end of this mode, basically, you restore the processor restores the checkpoint and resumes normal execution. What does that mean? Basically, the processor uh, restores the program counter of this long latency cache miss, restores the register file at that point, and re-executes all of these instructions again. And hopefully they won't cause cache misses. Let me show this pictorially. I mean, ideally what we really want is perfect caches, right? The processor computes, it gets, uh, it, it gets this load one instruction, let's say, it hits in the cache, and it keeps computing, it gets load two instruction, it hits in the cache, you never stall, right? Ideally that's what we want. But with a small window, this is what we get. The processor computes for a while, it gets this load one, it misses in the cache. The processor can continue fetching instructions for a while until its instruction window becomes full. But once its instruction window becomes full, it cannot continue fetching instructions. It stalls until this miss get ba gets back from memory. Right. And then once the miss is complete, the processor can keep retiring instructions and computes for a while. Compute meaning retire instructions. And until it gets uh, a load two cache miss, after which uh, the instruction window uh, becomes full after a while. After that, the processor keeps stalling until this load 2's uh, miss completes. Okay? In run-ahead execution processor, we're going to try to use these stall cycles, not stall, but keep processing instructions. And the idea is when you get this long latency cache miss, this uh, load, load 1 instruction becomes the oldest instruction in the window at some point. At that point, you take a checkpoint. Remember, oldest instruction, it's easier to take a checkpoint when the instruction becomes the oldest in the machine. Because you know that's not speculative. At that point, everything else before it is retired, and nothing after it has been uh, completed, or at least report its result to, uh, to the checkpoint. So you take, take a checkpoint here, checkpoint the program counter, checkpoint the register alias table, and for some, some other things, as you will read uh, in your reading, for performance purposes, like the uh, return address stack and the global history register because we're going to get back to this point. And the processor keeps speculatively processing instructions without stalling for long latency cache misses. It will still stall for other reasons, but not for long latency cache misses. That's called the run-ahead uh, execution mode. And the processor, during this time, reaches this load 2, because now it can fetch it instead of stalling, and it can generate load 2's miss, because it can execute load 2. And this miss gets start servicing in parallel with the miss 1, load 1's miss. After a while, this load one miss returns from memory, and the processor flushes its pipeline and returns to the checkpoint, restarts with load one. So at this point, load one hits in the cache because its miss just returned, and the processor keeps computing. After a while, the second miss completes, and by the time the processor executes load two, load two's request has already completed, and it's already in the cache. As a result, you get a cache hit. And you save cycles, because what you've done is, essentially, instead of stalling over here, you've pre-executed instructions, and you've prefetched this miss too. Yes? So is this kind of just like slipstreaming, but for a single core? That's a, that's a good point. At, at some level, you could think of it that way, actually. You're, you're, you're slipstreaming within a single context. Yeah. You're checkpointing the architectural state, running ahead, and going back. You're absolutely right. You don't need a separate context. You could have done this with a separate context. In, back, in fact, IBM Power 6 does that. IBM Power 6 implemented run ahead execution in that form. What they did was uh, they, they had a, a two-way two processor. Two, well, two-way meaning they had two thread contexts. 
And one, once you get a long latency cache miss, you actually launched another thread in the thread context that does exactly this. So that's how they tolerate the memory latency. That way, the benefit of that is you don't need to flush the pipeline right at the end. The upside of this is you don't need another thread context. OK? That's the idea. So how do you actually uh, uh, support this? We'll talk about that. But let's take a look at the benefits of this. The benefits actually are multiple. Instead of stalling during a long latency cache miss, and I say L2 cache miss, but there, you could actually do this for L3 cache misses or even an L1 cache miss. I'm not talking about an L1 cache miss, L2 cache hit, because these are relatively easily tolerated with a small window size. Right? It all depends on the latency. If the memory latency is 10 cycles, then you can have a small window and tolerate that latency. right? If the memory latency is 1,000 cycles, then good luck tolerating that with a small window. So instead of stalling during a long latency cache miss, you're pre-executing these loads and stores. And these loads and stores that are independent of the L2 miss instructions generate very accurate data prefetches. Uh, and this is true for both regular and irregular access patterns. This is independent of the access pattern. right? You're really pre-executing the program. You're doing what the program would do or would have done, assuming it went through that path. That's why these are very accurate. Uh, instructions on the predicted program path are also prefetched into the instruction, uh, or trace caches. We'll not talk about trace caches, but uh, the, the model that we evaluated this on had a trace cache. And again, if you take 742, you'll see what a trace cache is. And the L2. Basically, you get good instruction prefetching also, yes. That's right. That's perfectly possible, actually. Because if you actually, what you're really doing, and that's true for a large instruction window also. Because what might happen is, uh, what you're doing really is you're predicting the branches. And if your branch prediction is wrong, and the instructions that you're executing on the wrong path are fetching data that you're not going to use on the correct path into the cache, you may be polluting your cache. You may be evicting something from your cache that's actually useful for later. And we've actually analyzed a lot of those benefits in, the, in these papers. You can look at my thesis for that. And I'll, 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 I can give you other pointers, too. But it turns out, I'll give you the gist uh, for most workloads. Uh, it turns out executing on the wrong path is uh, like the memory references that you generate on the wrong path are usually more beneficial than harmful. Why? Because while you're executing on the wrong path, you're generating some memory references that are going to be useful for the correct path also. Some of them are useful. Some of them are harmful. And on average, it turns out executing on the wrong path is useful. It's a pretty interesting topic, actually. <laughs> How do you make wrong path even more useful? People have looked at that also. <laughs> OK. And the third benefit is uh, the hardware prefetcher and branch predictor tables are trained using future access information. Now you've got to be careful with this, because you need to, uh, what you're doing when you're executing in runhead mode is you're really using future access information and training the uh, hardware prefetcher and branch predictor tables. But you need to ensure that they're not, you're not polluting the hardware prefetcher and branch predictor tables as well. OK, I'm not going to go into that in more detail. So let's take a look at the uh, mechanism in a little bit more detail. How do you enter run ad mode? Basically, you need to checkpoint the architectural state, register state, because you're going to go back. You need to have the state. Uh, well, let's see. At the time, this load instruction was actually at the head of the reorder buffer. You need to have the program counter. You need to have the register alias table. And you need to ensure that no uh, instruction deallocates the entries in the register alias table for, uh, um, uh, for that state. Basically, you need to have the register file state at that point. Right? And also, uh, you, you need to checkpoint some structures that are important for performance. This is, these are for functional reasons or correctness reasons. Because you need to be able to get back, because you're going to enter the speculative processing mode. And for performance reasons, checkpoint the return address stack and global history register is a good idea. Because if you go back, you're going to actually predict some calls and returns later on, right? You don't want to pollute the state of the register alias table with speculative instructions. Similarly with the global history register. Global history register is important because it tells you this is the context at which I'm predicting this branch. If you actually speculatively execute instructions and polluted this global history register, once you get back, that's a totally different context. Right. OK, let's take a look at instruction processing in run-ahead mode in a little bit more detail, and then we'll talk about exit from run-ahead mode. Well, exit from run-ahead mode is simple, basically. You restore this architectural state from the checkpoint. 
and you flush the pipeline, of course. It's like a branch miss prediction, except uh, the, uh, the architectural state that you use for restoration is different, right? It's really associated with this load. OK, let's take a look at instruction processing. The run aid mode processing is exactly the same as normal mode processing, except for two main differences. Uh, and that's what make this, makes this attractive, because it's, it doesn't change a whole lot in the instruction processing engine. First, it's purely speculative. right? Architectural register and memory state is not updated in run ahead mode. And you can ensure that basically by not updating the memory state, right? You don't commit results into memory. This raises the question what do you do with the stores? And we'll talk about that in a second. And the second is L2 Mr. Band instructions are identified and treated specially, as I uh, told you. Uh, their results are not trusted. And we use this invalid bit associated with each result to keep track of that. And we'd like to quickly remove them from the instruction window instead of waiting for them to complete. Otherwise, we'd be defeating the purpose. Right? There are two types of results that are produced, invalid and valid. Invalid means it's dependent on an L2 miss. And you can, uh, you can distinguish a result, uh, result status by adding one more bit uh, to each result. Invalid results are marked using invalid bits in the register file and the store buffer, because you don't, need to trust, you don't want to trust them. And they're not used for prefetching or branch resolution. Well, what does this mean, basically? If a branch's source register is invalid, you're not going to resolve that branch. Right? Then the question is, what do you do with that branch? Right? Well, you, one option is to trust the branch predictor, which is probably a good option if your branch prediction accuracy is really high. And that's what uh, we have done. And that's what other runhead execution implementations have done. Uh, how do you remove the instructions from the window? Let's take a look at that first. Uh, during the speculative processing mode, you take a look at the oldest instruction in the window, and it's examined for what's called pseudo-retirement. It's really not retirement, because you're not updating the architectural state. If, if you have an invalid instruction, it's removed from the window immediately. Its result is useless. Right? You don't even know the result. If it's a valid instruction, it's removed from the window when it completes execution or becomes invalid. Right? Uh, these pseudo-retired instructions free their allocated resources, any kind of buffer entry, such that you can put another instruction, a new instruction to the machine. Uh, and these pseudo-retired stores communicate their data to dependent loads. So if you have a store in the machine that actually is pseudo-retiring, that's getting out of the machine, if you would like to do good uh, run aid execution, if that value is later useful for the prefetching of a load, you'd actually like to have that result communicated to the later load. So how do you do that? Uh, normally, this is done through the store buffer, right? But store buffer doesn't store the results of instructions that are not in the instruction window anymore. Normally, what you do when you commit a store is write the result into the cache. Right? But we cannot write the results into the cache because cache is architectural state. You don't want to expose these results, these stores, because they're purely speculative. So uh, we add a, a dedicated memory structure called run ahead cache, if you will. A pseudo-retired store writes its data and invalid status to this dedicated memory. And the purpose is solely data communication through memory in run ahead mode. Kind of like a register file, but it's for memory. A dependent load reads its data from this run ahead cache. And the key realization is that this does not need to be co correct. You don't even need to do this. This is a performance optimization. So you can have a store instruction in run ahead mode. And it could be valid or invalid. It doesn't matter. What you could do is you could drop the store. Right? You could say, when I'm taking this store out of this machine, I'm dropping it. I'm going to forget its result, whatever its result is produced. It's OK, because this is purely speculative. This will not affect correctness. You're going to go back to the checkpoint and re-execute everything anyway. Doing so, it turns out, is bad, because there may be later instructions that you get in run ahead mode, later loads, that may need that value, that may access the same address the store is storing to. That's the purpose of this run ahead cache. This is a small extended store buffer, if you will, that actually uh, stores the data of the stores that are pre-processed in run execution mode. Does that make sense? Now, you don't have to have this. Again, this is a design choice. You don't have to have this uh, special memory structure. You could actually modify the cache structure to achieve the same effect. For example, one thing you could do is you could write to the cache and say, oh, this is actually speculative. The result was produced in run ahead mode, right? such that and whenever an instruction executes, it checks uh, whether the result was produced in run ahead mode. And if the processing is currently in run ahead mode, that's great. You can get that value. But if the processor is in normal mode, then you don't touch that value. 
because that value was produced in Renahead mode and it was, it was purely speculative. Right. Yes? You said that if an instruction is based on a loader store that's missing, you just drop it, right? What if like a branch that comes after that or a load from a specific that comes after that is based upon those calculations? Uh -huh. you just drop those also? Exactly, yes, exactly. And this is, I think, the branch. Basically, if a branch is dependent on a uh, load value, it cannot be resolved, right? Uh, this is called a mispredicted, uh, well, this is an invalid branch. If it's actually mispredicted, then you, the processor stays on the wrong program path until the end of run execution, right? Because there is no way of knowing what the correct direction for this branch is, because you do not know the value this, uh, this branch is dependent on. Uh, it turns out this is, this degrades the be performance benefit of run execution and out of order execution in general, right? In out of order execution, if you have a long latency load instruction, a branch dependent on it, the processor predicts the branch, and you keep fetching instructions. And it's, it takes a long time to, for you to figure out that you're on the wrong path, because the branch is dependent on a very long latency instruction. Right? On the other hand, if you have a valid branch, you can resolve the valid branch and initiate recovery if the branch is mispredicted. So you could actually uh, do branch misprediction handling in run-ahead mode. OK? OK. Any questions? So the reading that I've uh, asked you to do for this week actually discusses the processor implementation in a lot more detail than I have done over here. Uh, but I've given you the basics and fundamentals of how it works. So hopefully you'll enjoy the reading. So let's take a look at the advantages and disadvantages of this kind of uh, mechanism. I've already given you a couple of advantages. Uh, it turns out this leads to very accurate prefetches for data and instructions at all cache levels. Uh, in fact, I don't remember it off the top of my head, but the accuracy is on the order of 96%. 96% of all of the requests cache misses generated uh, are reused later on. It's very difficult to design a prefetcher that's that accurate because this follows a program path. It's relatively simple to implement because most of the hardware is already built in. Right? You're really utilizing the out-of-order execution machinery and adding another checkpoint to it uh, and adding these invalid bits and adding this run ahead cache for store load communication. Uh, Compared to other pre-execution based prefetching mechanisms, which we will briefly talk about, but I've given you the basic idea. The basic idea is you have multi-threaded hardware, and you launch a thread that actually prefetches for the main thread, like the slipstreaming idea that we've discussed. It doesn't need a separate thread context. It uses the same thread context as the main thread. Right? And you don't need to construct a pre-execution thread. By the way, you could do that kind of prefetching today uh, on uh, processors that have uh, hyper-threading, as Intel calls it, or simultaneous multi-threading. Right. OK, there are a bunch of disadvantages and limitations which we will discuss and we'll try to solve also. Obviously, you're executing extra instructions, right? Because we're processing some instructions and we're reprocessing them. And you could actually be reprocessing the same instruction many, many times. Uh, as we've discussed, uh, it's limited by branch prediction accuracy. And any kind of large instruction machine, large instruction window machine is limited by branch prediction accuracy because you're fetching many instructions. And if your branch prediction accuracy is not perfect, you're fetching lots of them on the wrong path. We've discussed that many times. Uh, this is, I guess, an answer to your second, the second part of your question. What happens if you have a load that's dependent on this cache miss? Right? And if this load happens to be a cache miss somehow, you later figure out, well, you cannot parallelize them. You cannot prefetch them. So if you're doing a linkless traversal, for example, and if the first access is a cache miss, you cannot do the second access because you cannot generate the address of, this, of that second access. Too bad. We'll try to solve this problem, actually. Any, any thoughts on what could the solution be? Yes? Well, can you also have a load target buffer or something like that? Load target buffer. <laughs> I see. So what you're basically saying is somehow predict load the value, prediction. load address prediction. Exactly, load address prediction. That's right. Actually, that's, that's one potential solution. And we'll try to do that with one prediction mechanism that I'll describe later on. Well, uh, actually, load value prediction. You, we're we're going to try to, well, you could, do the, you could do it two ways, right? You could predict the value of the load that actually generated the cache miss, or you could predict the address of the load uh, that actually have, has an invalid uh, source. Yeah, but that's in right. this case, Well, let me show you the, uh, the mechanism. You could do it both ways. You could do it both ways. It depends on which one you're predicting. If you're predicting the uh, load that's dependent on the invalid load, you, could, you want to predict the address. If you're 
uh, you could alternatively predict the value that's produced by the load that's actually the ancestor, if you will. And then implicitly, you're predicting the address. OK. So uh, the other uh, limitation is that the effectiveness of this is limited by available memory level parallelism in your program. So if your misses, uh, long latency cache misses, are far apart from each other in the program, this may not work, right? You may be pre-executing lots of instructions and not, getting, not seeing any cache miss. OK, we'll see that, actually. That leads to inefficiency of the mechanism. And uh, we'll talk about this later. But memory latency limits how long you can run ahead, right? If you run ahead very short, if, uh, so let's, let's say uh, it takes 500 cycles to, uh, uh, to service a load. And your run ahead execution interval is that 500 cycles. But you needed only 505 cycles, five cycles more, to generate the next L2 cache miss. Well, too bad. You've executed all these instructions, and you've flushed the pipeline in after 500 cycles. If you had gone a little bit longer, then you could have prefetched that next L2 cache miss. But you're limited by this memory latency. That's the upside of having another context do this. Right? If you have another context that actually does run ahead execution, another uh, thread that actually does run-ahead execution, you could keep going on run-ahead execution. And that's what IBM Power 6 and Sunrock did. They had an, another context. When they didn't have that context, they used the same context. OK. Let's take a look at the performance of this. What is a performance improvement? Uh, I'll show you some results. These are actually in the paper also. But these were the suites that Intel used to design its processors at, the, at that time. So this gives you an idea of what kind of suites they used. These are the spec workloads, Standard Performance Evaluation Corporation actually publishes some workloads uh, that all uh, processors are benchmarked with. And these were the CPU workloads, CPU intensive workloads. Some web workloads, some multimedia workloads, some office productivity workloads, so Word, Excel are here, for example. Some server workloads are over here, like transaction processing. Uh, some workstation workloads, for example, the Verilog simulations are sped up by this. Actually, Verilog was one of the <laughs> example. Ver a Verilog simulator was one of the programs over here. It gets sped up a lot, actually. It's a, it has a memory bottleneck. But basically, if you look at this, uh, I show you four processes. And this is the average across all of the suites over here. And this is micro operations per cycle on a three byte processor. Mm. And this is, uh, so there are four different machines. One machine is a, a, a not state of the art machine with no prefetcher and no run ahead. The second machine is the baseline, which has a good, very aggressive prefetcher that we will briefly talk about. The third machine has only run ahead execution, not prefetcher. And the fourth machine, the red one over here, has both prefetcher and run ahead with some configuration. So the performance improvement, average performance improvement of run ahead execution compared to the baseline, the good baseline with the prefetcher, is 22% on average. And you can see that uh, sometimes, uh, most of the time, uh, the machine with just run ahead is better than the machine with the prefetcher. But sometimes the machine with just the prefetcher is better than the machine with just run ahead. That kind of tells, uh, and the prefetcher in this case was a streaming prefetcher. It latches on to regular access patterns. And it turns out this, uh, this suite over here has very regular access patterns. And you can prefetch them much more effectively compared to using run ahead execution. Because run ahead execution has overheads also, right? You need to flush the pipeline. Uh, Actually, that was one of the disadvantages. That should have been one of the disadvantages over here. You need to flush the pipeline every time you do run ahead. OK, so that's one example. Uh, this is one result. The other result is how does this compare to a large instruction window? Uh, that was one of the things that, were, uh, that was interesting, obviously, because we're trying to approximate the benefits of a large instruction window. We're not getting all of the benefits of a large instruction window, right? We're getting the memory level parallelism of benefits of a large instruction window, because this is a purely speculative processing mode. We're not saving results. Render execution doesn't save any results uh, that, are, that is produced during run-ahead mode. Whereas if you have a large instruction window machine, you keep everything in the machine, right? You keep the results. You, don't, you not only tolerate latencies of long latency cache misses, but you tolerate the latencies of floating point instructions, any short latency operation, any L, uh, L1 cache miss, L2 cache hit. So this is uh, the machine that I showed you earlier, the good baseline, 128 entry window with, uh, without run ahead. And run execution buys you about 22% over here, I believe. And so it does better than a machine with 256 entry window. It does close to a machine with 384 entry window. Make sense? So you get almost close to uh, a window 
uh, that's three x the size, right? In terms of performance, but the efficiency is a lot higher because you don't need to build that large window. And you can read the paper for analysis of some of these benchmarks. Sometimes, uh, for example, in some workloads, Reneid is uh, not as good as Reneid is better than a machine that has even a 1,028 entry window, a 1,024 entry window. Why? Because it's more important to run ahead and generate the cache misses than have a 1,024 entry window machine, right? Because Reneid is very efficient at generating new cache misses. Okay. Any thoughts? All right. Well, I guess I. Uh, this is, this is one of the things that I was uh, going to discuss. When is, uh, maybe I'll, uh, I'll let you think about this for a while. Reneid versus a real large window. When is one beneficial, when is the other? What are the pros and cons of each? Any thoughts? So Reneid is definitely not a large window, right? It's approximate the benefit of it, yes. Well, you said that even if you take the wrong path, mm -hmm. those addresses that you generate hits for still benefit you in some way. Mm -hmm. Whereas if you're not doing it speculatively, you just generated a bunch of data that you don't need. So in the case that your predictor is really bad, maybe run away is better because you can still benefit a lot from the mispredicted path. Mm -hmm. But that's true for the large instruction window also, right? Okay. Yes, you, ha you had some idea? or um, no? Maybe for the learner, it's more you executing instructions too late. And maybe for the, when you, when you have a large instruction window, you're not executing everything. That's right, exactly. So that's one way, one reason run ahead could be worse than the large instruction window, right? Because run ahead flushes the pipeline and re-executes the instructions many, many times. So it's energy inefficient in that sense. With a large instruction window, you execute instructions once, uh, and as a result, you could be more efficient. A large instruction window still stalls. Actually, this was another reason why run ahead uh, does better than. Okay, if you look at here, it's more clear here. Uh, this is 128 entry window plus run ahead. This is a 512 entry window machine. And run ahead does better. Why? Because even a 1024 entry window stalls in this case, because you have lots of cache misses that are dependent on each other. Whereas with run ahead, you don't stall. You keep going. You keep farther. Uh, so I can give you some numbers, actually. With uh, the average number of instructions that are executed in a run ahead period, run ahead mode, uh, is about 711 across all of these workloads. So it's much larger than a 512 entry window machine. Make sense? OK. I'll let you think about this. There, you can actually have a long list over here. And this was part of the uh, exam question, uh, or final exam question, last year. So you can take a look at some of these graphs. OK. Uh, I guess I'll, uh, I'll leave with a couple of things, and then we'll take a break. Uh, so Renate is by no means just for out-of-order execution, right? You can have an in-order execution machine. Uh, ha we have no instruction window. But whenever you get a cache miss, you could go into run-ahead mode. Right? That's the idea over here. Uh, well, how does run-ahead fare if you have in-order execution? And the mechanism is the same, exactly the same almost. right? In fact, you could say even simpler. So one, one thought we had at the time was, if you actually implemented in order, in, an in-order machine and added run-ahead to it, would it? perform similarly to out-of-order execution? And the answer is no, if you look at this. This is the performance of the in-order machine. This is in-order plus run-ahead. So it buys you about 39%. And this is out-of-order execution by itself. So there's still a 30% gap between the, or maybe more than 30% gap over here, between the in-order plus run-ahead machine and the out-of-order machine. And this is the performance improvement the run-ahead execution gets on top of the out-of-order machine. And it's a little bit different because these are uh, run for a different length of instructions, different number of instructions. So the takeaway is Reddit is beneficial on an in-order machine. In fact, even more beneficial, right? Because you get approximately 40% performance improvement compared to 20% performance improvement if you, uh, when you add run ahead on, on top of out-of-order execution. Why? Because in-order machine actually has no latency tolerance at all. It's in-order execution. It stalls uh, whenever you uh, have a dependent instruction. With rendered execution, you're tolerating the memory latency, so you get significant performance benefit. Okay. These are actually slides from, so Sun Rock was uh, the first processor that implemented rendered execution. And these were the slides uh, presented by one of their uh, architects uh, in August 2008. They had an in-order machine, 
Uh, and they called it scout execution. Basically, you're scouting out and figuring out all of these cache misses, right? Uh, and this is an interesting uh, graph because it shows the trade-off they made. This is their L2 cache size, uh, swept bet between 256 kilobytes to 64 megabytes. And this is normalized instructions per cycle. Higher is better. And if you look at this, uh, at, with a uh, for a rock machine, in-order machine, with 512 kilobyte L2 cache, run it execution, scout execution by is approximately 40% performance. And if you actually implement run it execution on top of a machine that has one megabyte, it has performance equivalent to a machine without run ahead, but that has an eight megabyte L2 cache size. So you could think of it as using run it execution to reduce space of the cache. Instead of implementing an eight megabyte cache, you implement run it execution and save seven megabytes. And here, uh, this is actually across commercial workloads that they were interested in examining, a lot of online transaction processing and database workloads. This is Sun, right? They were doing that kind of processors. Now it's Oracle. They were bought by Oracle. Uh, uh, and at this point, it actually buys 12 megabytes. So this is another uh, way of designing machines, right? How, what do you actually, the mechanisms that you add to the machine can enable you to save other things in the machine and maybe add more processors. And that's the choice they made, actually. They implemented rendered execution, got rid of some of their cache, and added more processors. OK. I guess let's take a five minute break over here, and we'll talk about the enhancements to run ahead to try to solve some of the issues that we've discussed. Let's try to alleviate some of the uh, disadvantages of run ahead. So, this was you know, a required reading. But these are some of the recommended readings as to how to alleviate some of the disadvantages. I don't think I'll get a chance to cover wrong path events, so I'll give you the brief idea, basic idea. So this is actually applicable to large instruction window processors. Branch prediction is a big problem, right, as we've discussed. And as you increase the size of the instruction window, this becomes an even bigger problem because the potential you can exploit with a large instruction window is enabled by your branch prediction accuracy, right? If you're not pr predicting your branches correctly, then you'd be spending most of your time on the wrong path, especially if your branches take long time to resolve. So one key question was, can we somehow figure out if branch is mispredicted before the branch gets resolved? If the branches depend on a long latency instruction, let's not wait until that long latency instruction executes, but somehow predict that we mispredicted the branch. It's kind of cool, right? <laughs> we haven't predicted it correctly. Well, we, we predicted it when we fetched it, but we're going to reevaluate that decision later on based on whatever happened in the machine. And the idea is, can we somehow find events uh, that if we see those events, we can tell with a good certainty that something went wrong. Some branch was mispredicted in the machine. And that was the idea of wrong path events. So there are several events, it turns out, that indicate branch mispredicts in the machine. One good event is dereferencing of a null pointer. So if you actually have a load instruction that dereference a null pointer, you can, you can guess that, oh, something went wrong in the previous instructions. Right? Or your program is wrong. Right? <laughs> it's one of those. Or a fault happened in the machine, actually. These are all possible causes. But more than likely, it's really that your branch was mispredicted because that's a much more common event than either of the other two. And actually, if you, if you have a bug in your program, you don't care, right? Because your program doesn't work. Uh, if you have a fault in the machine, then you care, but you, can, you may not be able to do much about it. But if it's actually a branch misprediction, if you actually hedge your bets in the machine that when you see a, low, uh, when you see a null pointer dereference, by an instruction, you can say, oh, something went wrong. So I'm, not, I'm going to stop fetching new, new instructions. That way, you can save energy, for example. Or you can say, something went wrong. Uh, uh, I fetched an instruction that actually dereferenced the null pointer, speculatively. Uh, one of the previous branches must have been mispredicted. And then you can start recovery early for one of those branches. Right? That's the idea of wrong path events. Uh, another example of these events is you actually decode an illegal instruction. This happens on the wrong path much more often than it happens on the correct path. Because if it's on the correct path, then your program is again wrong, right? Again, the other reason for this could be you have a fault in the machine. Uh, some particle struck your, machine, struck your machine, and actually one of the register values flipped. That's another reason why this could happen, right? But like, that's, again, much less likely than having a branch misprediction. So it's a good bet if you decode an illegal instruction that you're on the wrong path. Another is you have. Uh, and, uh, mm, an address out of range exception. 
when you access an address. Right? These kind of things. Uh, the, uh, the other interesting one is actually if you keep getting lots of mispredictions in a sequence, that's a good indicator that you may have mispredicted a branch earlier. Again, this is a, a, little, a little bit softer indicator, but it's still a good indicator. Because that could be usually due to two reasons. One is either you mispredicted a branch, and you, your branch predict is totally off now. You're exploring some paths that you've never seen before. Or you're really, really exploring some paths you've never seen before. Your program is going through a phase change. In either case, uh, well, you're mispredicting some branches. OK, so that's the idea of wrong path events. Can we somehow detect, look at some illegal or unusual behavior, and use that as a hint that one of the branches was mispredicted? What are those events? And how do you exploit this behavior? Well, it turns out how do you exploit this behavior is a little bit difficult, because once you actually figure out with some good certainty that something went wrong in the machine, how do you exploit it? Which branch is mispredicted is a good question. Now you'll need to figure out which branch is mispredicted if you have multiple branches in the machine. OK, I'm not going to go over that in more detail unless we, have, we magically have some time at the end of this lecture. But let's take a look at some of the other disadvantages of our net execution and uh, try to solve them. Uh, there are three of them, uh, limitations at least. One is energy inefficiency. We're executing a large number of instructions speculatively. Uh, and how do we actually curb that? This is, uh, so the idea is to uh, do more efficient run execution. I'll talk about that. And these are some of the papers that are related to it. The second is what we've discussed earlier. Basically, if you have cache, a cache miss that's dependent on a previous cache miss, you cannot parallelize these cache misses. Because the second one needs the address, which has not been computed, because the first one, the first load instruction actually uh, add a cache miss. As a result, run execution is usually ineffective for pointer intensive applications, linked list traversals, for example, tree traversals. So we're going to try to fix that problem a little bit. And the third one is what I've discussed. When you have a branch that's mispredicted in run-ahead mode, and if that branch is actually invalid, depending on an L2 miss, you cannot recover from that. But maybe you can look at some of these other things that are going on in the machine and uh, use those as hints that this branch was mispredicted. So let's take a look at the efficiency problem in a little bit more depth. These are some of the workloads that we've tested run execution with. And I'm plotting here the percent increase in instructions per cycle performance due to run execution on the y-axis. Uh, these are the blue bars, the bars on the left for each benchmark. And this is the average over here. And the red bars show the percent increase in executed instructions compared to the baseline. So on average, uh, Runhead buys about 22% performance increase, IPC increase, at the cost of executing 27% additional extra instructions. This may be an OK trade-off, actually. But there are some workloads that uh, a Runhead processor executes significantly more extra instructions on, approximately 60%. Performance benefits are not commensurate, right? It's about 5% over here. There's another workload where actually Runhead degrades performance very little. Because, well, you, could, you should be thinking of why does run it degrade performance? It could be pollution, right? It could be because you're flushing the pipeline once in a while uh, and you're getting no benefit. And there's a significant number of executed instructions, like again, 50% more instructions. This is not good, right? And there's another workload where run it gets a lot of gains, performance gains, approximately 110% over here. But run it causes the execution of 235% extra instructions. So you get a lot of gain, but you also execute a lot of instructions. Then the key question is actually, how do we actually get the benefits that run -ahead execution gets without executing so many extra instructions? So we'll try to achieve that. We've actually uh, talked about a couple of these at a different level. Uh, but there are three causes of inefficiency in run -ahead execution. One is short run -ahead periods. We haven't talked about that as much. The second is overlapping run -ahead periods. And the third is useless run -ahead periods. Let's take a look at what these are. Uh, short run ahead periods are run ahead periods where you enter run ahead mode and you exit relatively quickly. Instead of 500 cycles or 1,000 cycles, you stay in run ahead mode 10 cycles or 50 cycles. Now, you don't want to do that, right? Because if it's only 10 cycles, probably your instruction window can tolerate that latency. So th these uh, can be caused by multiple things. Because you can go into run ahead mode, your oldest instruction is an L2 cache miss, but it's also already an outstanding L2 cache miss. Right? Instead of uh, 50 cycles later, this L2 cache miss will complete, and you will keep going, keep executing instructions. 
It's a, it could be an outstanding cache miss because uh, it could be generated by the prefetcher, it could be generated by the wrong path, or a previous run ahead period. Right? So this is the idea. When you get an L2 cache miss, you go into run ahead mode, and then you uh, enter, uh, let's say you uh, generate another L2 cache miss, and this miss starts getting serviced over here. Later on, uh, you get out of run ahead mode because the uh, the miss that caused entry into run ahead mode got complete. You flush the pipeline. Load 1 now hits. And later on, when the processor actually executes load 2 again, it gets a cache miss again. Why? Because this miss has not been completed yet. Right. The, the previous run ahead mode started, but it didn't complete it. As a result, the processor enters run ahead mode for a really short time. Now, you'd like to ideally avoid this run ahead mode, right? Because it's, you can tolerate this latency, perhaps, with the instruction window. Or maybe it doesn't matter. Because if you run ahead only by this much, you'll execute very few instructions, and you're not going to get to the next L2 cache miss. And that's the, the idea here is to detect these periods and get rid of them. Uh, so these, these periods are bad. These short run ahead episodes or periods are bad because they're less likely to generate useful L2 misses because you're not running ahead far. And they also have high overhead due to the flush penalty at the run ahead exit. If you look at this, the amount of time you spend flushing the pipeline is very close to the amount of time you actually ran ahead. Right. Okay. I'm not going to give you the solutions to this. The paper actually, you can, you can imagine some solutions, right? You can actually say, you can actually look at how long the miss has been outstanding, for example, uh, when you have a, when you're considering entering run ahead mode. If the miss has been outstanding for a long time, maybe you say, okay, let's not enter run ahead mode for this load instruction. You could do even more sophisticated techniques. Uh, but let's not uh, go into that. But actually, if you, if you do those techniques, if you do some of those techniques, you can get rid of these periods relatively easily. The second uh, cause of inefficiency is overlapping run ahead periods. Uh, and these are run ahead periods where two peri uh, these are two run ahead periods that execute the same instructions, or almost the same instructions. Let me give you an example. These are usually caused by uh, dependent misses. So let's say you enter run ahead mode due to this load one miss. You execute in run-ahead mode, and you have a load 2 that's invalid because its address is dependent on this load 1. You exit run-ahead mode. Later, you execute load 2. Now you can compute the address of load 2, and it misses in the cache. It's a long latency cache miss. And you do run-ahead execution on that one. If you look at these two periods, the instructions that are executed after load 2 in the first period overlap with the instructions that are executed at the very beginning for a long time, perhaps, uh, of the second run-ahead period, right? Because these are starting from load 2. Now, there may be differences because branches may be predicted differently, but many of these could be the same. So the second period is usually inefficient. Actually, it could actually lead to new cache misses because now you have another value that's available, which is the value of this load, right? But more often than not, it's inefficient. OK. Again, you can think about solutions to uh, fix this problem, and the paper that I've recommended to you uh, provides a solution. But I'm not going to go into that detail. But we'll actually see a solution later on today. The third uh, problem is periods that do not result in pre prefetches for normal mode. These are actually periods that are kind of useless otherwise. right? If you look at this, uh, let's say you enter run ahead mode with load 1. You run ahead, you exit, and it's good for nothing. Because there is no cache miss that is generated during run ahead mode. Right? So these actually exist due to the lack of memory level parallelism. Uh, and you could eliminate these run ahead periods. I'll, I'll talk about a very brief mechanism over here. You could predict if a period will generate useful L2 misses, right? And you could have a predictor designed for this purpose. I'm not going to go into how you actually design this purpose, but actually useless period predictors designed for this purpose can be very effective. You could actually have programmer hints, program hints that could tell you. Uh, somehow, if you can say, oh, this is a part of the program where you won't see a lot of cache misses, if somehow that's accurate, you could use that to guide run ahead execution. Actually, that was one of the solutions that we've explored. But that requires some support from the software. But you could actually have a hardware predictor that does this also. OK, so I'm not going to give you the solutions, exact solutions. But if you actually figure out all of these problems and actually devise solutions to each of them, this is what you get. You could reduce the additional 27%, well, 26.5% extra instructions to 6.2%. While preserving, well, and these, these workloads, this was the workload that was not gaining a whole lot. You reduce, we reduced the 
extra instructions that are executed to run ahead. While preserving most of the performance benefit of run ahead execution, right? Instead of getting 22.6%, now you get 22.1% by getting rid of these inefficient periods. Make sense? So whenever you design a technique that's effective, it's always important to think about how to make it more efficient. These are techniques that do not make the technique uh, that do not make runhead execution more effective, although they do have the potential to. By getting rid of uh, some of these short periods, you're improving performance as well, right? Because you're not flushing the pipeline anymore as much. But on average, it, it turns out it's, they're not they're not making uh, the runhead execution more effective, but they're making it a whole lot more efficient. Instead of spending 25, uh, more than 25% additional instructions, you're spending only 6% additional instructions. OK. So when you go out and design techniques like this or some other way, always think about efficiency as well. Because additional instructions is always power in this case. Or inefficient mechanisms are always costing you power. OK. So uh, runhead execution, one, one big characteristic of runhead mode is it's purely speculative, right? You can do anything over there. And it won't affect correctness as long as you design that uh, period to be purely speculative. None of the results that are executed, uh, that are generated during runhead mode is reported to software. Because the real architectural state at that point is the checkpoint. You're going to restore the checkpoint once you get out of runhead mode. Uh, how do we achieve this goal? The goal is really to find and generate cache misses that would otherwise stall execution later on. Right? That's what we're trying to do. How do we achieve this goal most efficiently and with the highest benefit? And one idea is to find and execute only those instructions that will lead to cache misses. If you think about it, uh, when you're doing runhead execution, we're executing everything in the program. Right? Some of these instructions may lead to cache misses, may lead to the generation of an address, but some of those some of these instructions are kind of used for other things, right? They, don't, they never generate addresses. They never lead to the generation of addresses. Ideally, you would like to find only those instructions that lead to the generation of addresses, and in particular, the generation of addresses that cause cache misses. If you can somehow identify this, uh, you can make rendered execution even more efficient. How is the question, but I'm not going to answer that. But <laughs> that's, uh, this is something good to think about, because if you could do this, then it could solve a lot of the memory latency tolerance problems. But one idea could be, for example, the compiler or the hardware somehow generates a thread that's specially constructed for runhead execution. And when you get a long latency cache miss, you fetch from that thread and execute that thread. And that thread only does things that will lead to cache misses. It won't do the floating point operations that are not going to lead to cache misses. right? Because usually you perform some operations on an array that have nothing to do uh, with the computation of an address. That thread is specially constructed just to prefetch data. That could be a helper thread. That could be a runhead helper thread. How to do this? Uh, actually, this was an idea that uh, Intel had published in 2004 in an Itanium processor. What they did was they had, they called this the virtual multi-threading. And when, when the main program stalled for a long latency cache miss, they switched in a thread that was constructed exactly like this that did prefetching for the main program. So if you think about it, it's, it's kind of like run ahead. You're not using the main program, the entire main program, to execute instructions and do prefetching, but you're generating this helper thread that is switched in when the main thread stalls. Does that make sense? It's pretty interesting, right? You could, you could go crazy with all of these ideas. <laughs> and they sh they've demonstrated benefits from that. The upside of that is, now you can be a lot more efficient, because that thread can be constructed in such a way that it only executes instructions that lead to cache misses. The downside of that is you need to construct that thread. And how to construct that thread is actually not that easy. The upside of run execution is, well, you don't need a thread. You just use the main program and keep executing it. It's simple. The downside is it's not as efficient as constructing a thread. Okay. So let's take a look at the dependent cache misses problem. And I'll, if, if we finish it early, I'll let you out early this time. <laughs> so the second problem, the third problem, we've talked about uh, irresolvable branch matrix predictions a little, energy and efficiency, and ineffectiveness for pointer intensive applications. Let's try to solve that problem a little bit. So let's take a look at the problem. The problem is uh, you have a load 2 that's dependent on load 1. Load 1 causes entry into run ahead mode. Load 2 
is executed to a random hand mode or fetched, and you figure out that it's actually invalid, and the processor cannot compute the address of this load too. It keeps running ahead, and later on, it exits run ahead mode, and it executes load 2 because the value of load 1 is available at the end of run ahead mode. And it figures out that load 2 is a cache miss, long latency cache miss. And it enters run ahead mode again. So as you can see, uh, run ahead execution cannot parallelize dependent misses because it doesn't have the value for this dependent cache miss. This leads to wasted opportunity to improve performance. Because if you had actually parallelized, you would have improved performance. You didn't need to go into this second run ahead mode. And it leads to wasted energy because the second run ahead mode is really overlapping with the first run ahead mode, right? And we've actually done some studies. This is the beauty of using high-level simulation. You could actually change your simulator and say, model run ahead execution in your simulator, and say, if I get an invalid load that is a cache miss during run ahead execution, I'm going to magically say it's actually a cache hit, and I'm going to model everything as if it's a cache hit. Right? That's the beauty of high-level simulation, CLO. You can do that. And we did that for many workloads, and we found that if you actually did that magically, the loads that are executed in run-ahead mode that would have caused cache misses are actually turned into hits in the simulator. If you do that, performance would improve by 25%. Then the key question is, how do you actually approximate that 25%? So I'll tell you one method. Uh, basically, the idea, the goal is to parallelize these dependent cache misses. We'd like to enable the parallelization of those cache misses in run-ahead mode with a low-cost mechanism. How do you do it at low cost? And we briefly discussed this earlier, but we'd like to predict the values of Altumis address loads. And I'll tell you what, what, what these are, or pointer loads. Because this is really loading a pointer, right, if you think of it. Or at least it's loading something that you compute upon, maybe, that later leads to the address of this. It's loading the base of some pointer, perhaps. So we'd like to predict the value of this, such that we can execute this. Uh, an address load is a load that loads an address into its destination register, which is later used to calculate the address of another load. This is, think of this as a, opposed to a data load. A data load doesn't lead to the generation of addresses later on. You can read this paper for a lot more detail, actually. But the problem was this couldn't compute its address. If we actually predicted the value of this load, now we can use a predicted value to compute the address of load 2. And assuming the predicted value is correct, at the cache block level, at least. Now, you could start this miss, and you could parallelize that miss. And both of the loads hit when you exit run ahead mode. And you can save cycles. Make sense? So that's the idea. So how do you do that? And you also save speculative instructions as well, because you don't enter run ahead mode again. right? Uh, how do you do that? You could actually do that with different mechanisms. One, one option could be predict the value to be 0. right? if it's an address load. Well, that doesn't work too well. <laughs> Usually, pointers do not have base addresses that are 0. That may work for other kinds of things. For example, if this load is actually feeding a branch that is mispredicted, if you predicted the value to be 0, and 0 happens to correctly resolve the branch, then you can improve performance. Right? Well, you really want to predict the address of the second load somehow. And it turns out. Uh, well, 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 we'll try to do what's called AVD prediction. And I'll give you as if I knew all of this before. But this came out after analysis of many programs. So let's define the address value delta of a load instruction as this. AVD equals the effective address of the load minus the data value of the load. For some address loads, for some loads that load a pointer into their destination register, this AVD turns out to be stable. And the idea is to design a predictor that keeps track of this AVDs of these address loads. When a load is an Altumis in run-ahead mode, it consults this AVD prediction. And if the predictor returns a stable, confident AVD, the predictor says, oh, the last few times I've executed this load, I've seen that this effective address minus data value is constant. If that's the case, the predictor predicts the value of the load like this. You know the effective address of the load because that's the load that caused entry into run ahead mode, or that's the load that caused a cache miss during run ahead mode. You predict the AVD. Now the predicted value is effective address minus predicted AVD. Make sense? Assuming this is stable for that load. Kind of magic, right? <laughs> like, why would it be stable for 
loads. Now I'll give you the reasoning behind the magic also. But this is, I'm giving you as, as it was developed. Because what I found out was when I was looking at this problem, I've listed a bunch of values and addresses and a bunch of other things about each load. And I, by coincidence, found that uh, the address value delta of some loads are actually the same across a large number of executions. So why would that be the case? It turns out these stable AVDs occur because there's a lot of regularity in the way data structures are allocated in memory and traversed. And I'll give you two examples. There are two types of loads that can have stable AVDs. Traversal address loads are easier to understand. These are uh, uh, loads that produce addresses consumed by address loads. They're also leaf address loads. They produce addresses consumed by data loads. But let's take a look at the first one first. Uh, let's think about the case of a regularly allocated linked list. You have the first node allocated address A, and the node size is K. The second node allocated address A plus K, and the node size is K. The third node allocated address A plus 2K, and the node size is K, dot, dot, dot. Now, a traversal address load loads the pointer to the next node whenever you're accessing the previous node, right? It's basically this, what you do whenever you write a program to do a linked list traversal. That's what you usually do, right? Now, let's take a look at the execution of this load across this linked list that's regularly allocated. We're going to look, compute the address value delta. And its value delta, remember, is the effective address of the load minus the data value of the load. For the first execution, we're going to visit the first node. The effective address is loading this node, which is A, right? address of the node. The data value is the address of the next node, because node equals node next. right? We're loading the data value, which is A plus K. And address value delta is minus K, right? address minus data value. Let's, now, in the next iteration, we go to the next node. right? It's effective, the effective address of this load is now a plus k because we're loading the current node. The data value is a plus 2k because that's the pointer to the next node. Right? And the AVD is minus k. When we go to the next node, the effective address is the address of the node, a plus 2k. The data value is the address of the next node, a plus 3k. And the AVD is minus k. I keep doing that, assuming everything is regularly allocated like this, you get minus k AVDs for this for that particular instruction. So you have a stable AVD. And actually, you also have a striding data value, which means that you could, have, you could use a value predictor for this also. right? You don't need an AVD predictor. You could uh, keep track of the previous values generated by this load, and you could use a stride predictor. Striding data value because the stride uh, is instance, uh, the, stride, uh, the, the difference between the data values loaded by different uh, the consecutive instances of this instruction is always k. right? Make sense? So you could predict this load in two ways. You could have an AVD predictor, as I described it, or you could have a stride predictor that basically learns the stride for this load and always adds k to the previous value that was used for this load. Yes? And where are you keeping track of the node that you're at? Is that in the cache that you're making? Or is that so that's the effective address. You don't need to, so this is the effective address. Basically, ju just by looking at this instruction, you know its effective address, and you're predicting the AVD. What do you mean by effective address? When you execute the instruction, you compute an address, right? Load address. Uh -huh. So you know that address. You don't need to, so this is just an example that shows what's the effective address for this load. You don't need to keep track of the address of the nodes. When you execute this instruction, you do a load, the effective address is the address of the node. Make sense? So you're actually computing the address when you execute the instruction. Oh, I see what you're yes. saying. Okay. Yeah. okay. <laughs> it's a very simple mechanism because of that. If you needed to keep the addresses of all these nodes, that's, a, that's extremely expensive. OK. Any thoughts? Any questions? OK. Let's take a look at the other example, which is difficult to predict with a stride predictor. Uh, think about uh, a sorted dictionary. And this is one example, actually, that's used in a benchmark called parser. You have nodes that point to strings. And strings and nodes are allocated consecutively. But the dictionary eventually is constructed in a kind of a random way. There's no relationship between different nodes. So this is, let's assume that this is a string. It starts at address c. It's allocated. And then string size is k. And the node is allocated at address c plus k. And another string allocated at address f. And its node is allocated at address f plus k. 
And then you have a pointer from the node to the string. And node contains a bunch of other information also, like left, right pointers. And then you keep allocating these strings. And eventually, you form a dictionary out of these strings, which looks like a binary tree. And if you look at this, the distance between the string and the node is always constant, because you allocate the string first, allocate the node next, and the string is always size k. But because you've sorted all of these nodes, there is no relationship between the addresses of consecutive nodes in any way. It's kind of random, assuming your input string is random. So when you look up this dictionary for an input word, uh, what you need to do is basically you need to traverse the load and load the string. right? So you have a leaf address load that loads a pointer to the string of each node. This is kind of lookup function. You have an input word, and you start with a node. Uh, and then you basically have this uh, recursive function that does traversal. And there's this instruction that basically loads the string using the node pointer. Let's take a look at the execution of that instruction. Remember, AVD is effective address of that instruction minus the data value of that instruction. When you visit the first node with an input string, you first need to load the node. Its effective address is a plus k. Uh, and the data value is really a in this case, right? Well, I guess it's, uh, I'm assuming that, uh, uh, a, a, uh, I guess a plus k is actually the address of the uh, offset of the string over here. But you can, you can, ima you can imagine that. It's, it's not that hard to bridge that gap. Basically, the effective address of this instruction, when you visit this node, is a plus k. The data value is the address of this string, which is a. So your AVD is k. Now let's assume that you're traversing, based on the input, you, uh, the traversal takes you to the right node. The effective address of this instruction in that execution is c plus k, the address of the node. The data value is the address of the string, c. And the AVD is again k. Let's assume that, again, because of the word you're searching, you go here. The word doesn't match the string, so you keep going. You keep traversing the dictionary. Uh, the effective address at this node is f plus k, the address of the node. And the data value is f, address of the string. Now if you look at this again, you get a stable AVD. Because it so happens that this instruction is loading a string that's always allocated uh, k bytes higher or lower than the starting address of the node. If you have a regular memory allocation pattern. right? So you have a stable AVD, you can predict uh, whenever you load this node, you can predict the address of the uh, uh, string, which means that you can parallelize these two cache misses. Assuming this causes entry into runhead mode, you can parallelize this cache miss with it. Assuming these cause different locations, uh, different cache blocks. Right? Uh, the data value, uh, if you look at this, uh, is not predictable. Because assuming that these are all at different locations, at random locations, there's no stride over here. So in this case, you can use an AVD predictor and parallelize these cache misses, or parallelize these loads, but you cannot use a stride predictor. OK, any questions? It's pretty interesting, isn't it? So this is one example of a technique that takes advantage of regular memory allocation patterns to improve performance. There could be other techniques. But we're not going to go into that. Prefetching actually could take advantage of that also. Uh, you could use this for prefetching as well, but I'm not going to talk about that. So basically, how do you do this? Let's take a look at how you do this, and then we're going to uh, finish up soon. The insight is that uh, how do you ad identify these address loads in hardware? We, we were, remember, we were predicting address loads only. We don't care about data loads, because that's not going to lead to an address later on. How do you actually identify address loads in hardware? The insight is that if the AVD of a load is too large, the value that's loaded is likely not an address. Okay. Uh, why? Well, it turns out pointers are usually allocated from uh, a memory address range. right? So let's say you have, this is your address. Usually what happens is top n bits of the address are the same for pointers, because they're allocated from a similar region in the heap or on the stack. Right? So if you're actually loading a pointer, the effective address of the load, uh, that's uh, the effective address uh, of the load that's loading that pointer is very similar to the data value that's being loaded. They have the same n bits at top, if you will. 
because they're coming from the same address space, the uh, same parts of the address space. So you can keep track of loads that satisfy only this criteria, right? Basically, AVD is within some bounds, in absolute, within some bounds of absolute max AVD. This identification mechanism eliminates many loads from consideration. This way, you can enable the AVD predictor to be small because you, you're looking for only for these address loads. Another way of doing this is actually looking at uh, looking at your effective address and the data value after the execution, of course, and checking if the top n bits of the effective address and the data value actually match. If they're the same, and if this is actually a pointer, well, it's a pointer because it's your effective address, then you can guess with good certainty that this data value is really an address because the top n bits are the same. Now, you could be unlucky, and this could actually be a data value itself that happens to have top n bits the same with a pointer, but more often than not, that's not the case, assuming you have enough number of bits in n. OK, so let me give you the performance of AVD prediction, and uh, we'll conclude after that. This is, again, some other set of benchmarks that uh, are very intensive in pointer traversal, linked lists. This is a minimum spanning tree example, for example. This is a triad benchmark by, uh, by tonic sort. This is a traveling salesman problem, dot, dot, dot. This is a terribly written benchmark, actually. This is uh, a benchmark that's written, that could have been rewritten without the way it's written, <laughs> meaning you could have re-optimized the data structures and get a lot better performance. But there are programs like that in the world. <laughs> but basically, uh, this uh, shows the performance of Renet over here, normalized, uh, or normalized ex uh, number of executed instructions. Uh, if you add AVD prediction to Renet, you gain about 14% about performance benefit on these workloads. And most of the performance benefits come from this health, actually, which is a terribly written benchmark. But even if you eliminate it, there are a bunch of workloads that gain quite a bit. And you can actually reduce the number of executed instructions this way also, uh, because you're eliminating this additional run ahead period, right? The number of executed instructions reduces by approximately 15% if you do this. Of course, this doesn't get rid of all of the loads. If you don't have loads that have regular memory access patterns, like we've discussed, you may not be able to parallelize the cache misses. And this mechanism doesn't do that. So there's a lot more potential. Remember, I told you that the performance improves by 25% if you perfectly do this. Well, this is getting only a, about 14% of it, right? not 25%, which means that there is more potential. OK, I think I'll stop here. I'll leave you with the wrong path event slides if you're interested in that. We've discussed that, but I'm not going to cover the slides. Any questions, any burning questions? OK, I'll see you Wednesday then.